My name is uh, Chris Doran. I'm one of the CCFPEM residents. And this morning I'm going to be talking to you about the emergency management of the disparate casualty. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Grant Coom for all his help and support through the development of this uh, presentation. Um, and uh, he certainly helped make it what it is. Um, I'd like to note that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So originally these next two slides were a lot of writing, but uh, Dr. Coom pointed out, I think rightfully, that pictures speak louder than words. So I'm a non-traditional resident in the sense that I finished my family medicine residency in 2013. And I've been working with the, the Canadian Forces since as a medical officer. They sent me back to do my CCFPEM this year, and I'm very privileged to be here with all of you training at Western. The CF is internationally recognized for our dive and submarine medicine courses, and we educate ourselves as well as physicians from across the, the world, including Australia, the Netherlands, Israel, Singapore, uh, amongst others, and in the discipline annually. Our training consists of a two-week basic dive course discussing basic uh, physiology and screening of dive candidates, followed by a, an advanced six-week dive medicine course that focuses on dive injuries and, and advanced treatment, in clinic, including clinical hyperbarics. We also offer a two-week submarine medicine course that examines the unique environment within a submarine and the, the implications of escape and rescue. So I completed those courses very early in my career upon completion of residency, and then I worked in a family medicine clinic in the military that catered largely to divers and submariners. I've been on multiple, multiple international and domestic dive operations, including deep dive operations in Bergen, Norway, on ice dive operations in New Brunswick, as well as the High Arctic in Resolute Bay. And I've sailed through the Caribbean with ships team divers on HMCS Athabascan and on the west coast of Europe. I've also been the assistant course director for a submarine medicine course and have taught on it several times. Finally, I've also trained as a flight surgeon and worked with our SAR teams on the East Coast, which uh, uh, also do a lot of diving. Uh, that's actually me being hoisted into the cormorant in the top left corner there. I've had the, the, the I've been able to do that multiple times in my career and it never gets old, it's so much fun. So the question you're probably asking yourself is why does this matter? London's uh, essentially landlocked and uh, people certainly aren't diving deep in the Thames. However, uh, there are actually three dive schools in London and they, they train divers throughout the year. The freshwater Great Lakes are cold and, and deep and they have a relative lack of sea life, which sets the conditions for preservations of wrecks uh, that can date back all the way to the 1800s. They're a very popular destination for divers, and there's an estimated 4,000 possible wrecks in Ontario. In 2017, there were eight deaths across the country as a result of scuba diving, with two of them being reported in Ontario. Uh, worldwide, it's estimated that there's one to nine deaths per every 100,000 dives. And in terms of decompression sickness, in warm water, it's estimated that uh, every four out of 10,000 dives results in a case. and uh, in cold water, that increases significantly to 59 out of uh, 10,000. So we're gonna go through uh, some very basic physics and I'm gonna try to keep it as simple as possible. And then we're gonna talk about the barrel traumas, the arterial, uh, and then the dive-related emergencies. So the arterial gas embolism and the decompression sickness. And then we'll, we'll try to boil it down to a very simplified approach and, uh, and look at a couple cases. I've included this outline of, of the continents as a bit of grim trivia and, a high, and to highlight the unfortunate reality of the submariner. The red outline represents the submarine rescuable water. So if you're on a sub that becomes disabled and sinks to the bottom, you have a very slim chance of being rescued or being able to escape if you're within that red outline. Unfortunately, outside that red outline, the depth becomes so deep that that sub is likely to be lost at sea. So uh, in terms of uh, basic uh, and simple math, at sea level, the human body is subject to one atmosphere of pressure. So as you descend through the water column, every 10 meters adds an additional atmosphere of pressure. That pressure change is particularly striking when you consider that in order to decrease atmospheric pressure by just a half to 0.5 atmospheres, you have to ascend in the air column by almost 5,500 meters. The consequence of, being expo of exposing yourself to those significant pressures can be significant, as we'll discuss. So there's three basic gas laws that we're going to discuss. The first is, is Boyle's Law, and that really describes the, the pathophysiology and development of barrel trauma. So uh, simply put, uh, volume of gas, it varies inversely with pressure. So if you have gas in an enclosed space at sea level, and you go down 10 meters, or a full additional atmosphere, the 
the volume within that space will decrease to half. If you go down another atmosphere and, and triple the pressure, it'll decrease to a third and so on and so forth. Practically speaking for the human body, we have multiple air fluid cavities, air filled cavities, sorry, that, uh, that are lined by tissue. And uh, as we descend through the water column, that volume within those spaces will decrease. And if you don't add air to the system, uh, the, the soft tissues will be pulled uh, by negative, the negative pressure of that decreased volume towards the center of that space. And if the pressure becomes significant, uh, then you can get significant hemorrhage and bleeding and trauma to those tissues. Likewise, the, our lungs are the, the biggest air-filled spaces in the body. So if I take a full inspiration at sea level, and increase my, my lung capacity to six liters and then descend to 10 meters, suddenly that six liters becomes three liters. And then, I re, and then I ascend back to the surface, that three liters is back to six liters, there's no net gain in the system and, and presumably I have no ill consequence. The problem with diving though is that we're breathing compressed gas and we're adding air to the system. So if I take a deep breath at 10, at 10 meters, and expand my, my lungs to six liters and then ascend through the water column, that's, if I hold my breath and that water, air can't escape through the trachea, it'll expand to, to 12 liters by the time I hit the surface. And if it's not escaping through the trachea, it escapes elsewhere into the tissues as we'll discuss. So that describes the path to the development of barotrauma. The next two gas laws, Dalton's and Henry's, will describe uh, the development of decompression sickness. So we all know that the, the FiO2 of oxygen, uh, that uh, the normal air we breathe is, is, uh, is 21%. Um, and and uh, we also should all know that the, the other major constituent of air is, is nitrogen. And uh, though there's some minor components uh, that we can ignore for our purposes, the fracture of inspired nitrogen is, is 79% at, at sea level. Um, Put another way, the partial pressure of oxygen at sea level is 0.21, the pressure partial of, ox partial pressure of nitrogen at sea level is 0.79. If we double the pressure, those partial pressures uh, double. If we triple the pressure, those partial pressures triple. Uh, and that comes into play when you also consider, Henry, consider Henry's law, which uh, states that uh, uh, gas dissolved within a liquid or in our cases, our blood and our tissue, is proportional to the partial pressure of the gas that's equal, in equilibrium with that liquid. So essentially at sea level, we're saturated with nitrogen, our tissues are saturated with nitrogen at a partial pressure of 0.79. If we go down 10 meters and double the partial pressure of nitrogen, we, our tissues will absorb nitrogen and, uh, and eventually it'll reach equilibrium. If, uh, if we then ascend, suddenly our tissues are super saturated with nitrogen and that nitrogen will start to dissolve out into the, the tissue. A little bit of, uh, of uh, bubbling and, and uh, uh, extravasation in the tissue is normal in diving and, and the lungs can generally take care of it. But if there's a, a lot and, and we have a significant nitrogen load, it can cause significant consequences downstream as we'll discuss when we discuss decompression sickness. So this is a busy slide and I've really only included it to highlight the fact that diving is a physically demanding activity in a harsh, unforgiving environment. So divers are at risk of drowning, they're at risk of traumatic and environmental injuries independent of uh, the disparate injuries that we're going to discuss today, but we're really just going to discuss disparism. So uh, I'm not going to call anybody out for this case uh, and, and we're not going to go through it. Uh, I just want you to think about it and, and think about how you would approach this diver as we progress. So this is a 26 year old uh, male, dive, uh, male individual presenting with lower abdominal pain and leg weakness. He tells you uh, that six hours ago he was diving on a wreck at Tobermory. So the question you need to think as, about as we go through this is what else do you want to know? So we're going to divide this into disorders of descent, disorders that happen at the bottom, disorders that uh, happen as we ascend, and then disorders that tend to ha occur when we're at sea level. So in terms of uh, disorders of ascent, we're a diver and we're starting to dive. This picture is a picture of Herbert Niche. He's an Australian who, that, who holds multiple records for free diving. He uh, holds the record for holding his breath well over nine minutes. And uh, his deepest dive uh, 
was, that was sled aided was in 2012, and he went down to 253 meters and then ascended on a single breath. Unfortunately, following that dive, he experienced multiple strokes as a result of decompression sickness. But perhaps the most insane part of that is despite lasting deficits, he continues to free dive to this day. So the disorders of ascent are largely the non-pulmonary barotraumas. And, and as I said, we have multiple air-filled spaces uh, and potential spaces within our body. The ear and the sinuses are, are the most commonly affected. So as we descend, uh, the pressure increases, the volume within those cavity de decreases, creating a vacuum that pulls tissue and mucosa into the space. And it, and it tends to, to pull the tissue around the eustachian tube into that space and includes the eustachian tube. And if the diver doesn't do anything uh, to equalize that pressure, like a valsalva or one of the other mechanisms that they're trained to do to relieve that pressure, that pressure will continue it and, and can cause significant, uh, can cause significant uh, uh, trauma and hemorrhage within that space. Conversely, as we ascend, volume increases in those air fill filled spaces. And if that's not properly vented, uh, it can cause local tissue and ischemia and hemorrhage as well. This is uh, rever referred to as reverse squeeze. Um, and it's a bit less common because that expanding air tends to stent open the eustachian tube or the ostea of the sinuses and prevents uh, that buildup of pressure and allows it to vent on its own. So these are typically injuries on descent, but there, as we're talking about, there's certain instances where it can occur on ascent. Most of these are self-limited and, and treated with analgesia and close follow-up in the community, but occasionally uh, they do need to be referred to a specialist. So middle ear barotrauma is the most common form of barotrauma that we may see. Uh, and we've all experienced this to some extent, diving to the bottom of the pool, and you can feel that pressure building up. For divers, they're trained to clear that pressure uh, with Valsalva, or they can, a lot of them can stent open their eustachian tube with a jaw thrust as they go down, and, and can keep air entering into that system and preventing that, uh, that pressure. Uh, for divers, it's generally self-limited. They know it's happening and uh, they can either fix it or they call off the dive and, and they can have some oral fullness and, and discomfort for a few days. Uh, but uh, experienced divers will wait till that clears and, uh, uh, and before they dive again. However, uh, if uh, they are presenting to the to the emergency department, you're likely to see some of the more higher grade injuries. So you may see significant you know, tympanum, and uh, you may also see perforation. In those instances, um, treatment with uh, antibiotics is certainly worthwhile to consider because the, the uh, waterways aren't particularly sterile. And uh, if there is a perforation, uh, refer to the ENT on a sort of urgent outpatient, outpatient basis is reasonable so that they can confirm that, that TM uh, heals and there's no significant lasting hearing deficit. If you're seeing a lower grade uh, middle ear barrel trauma, you can counsel the, pa the patient that once the, the pain and discomfort resolves and they regain normal eustachian tube function, um, uh, they can return to diving, but it's generally a good idea that they follow up uh, with their family physician just to make sure there's no uh, ongoing uh, evidence of, of trauma. So, uh, so that is very different than inner ear barrel trauma. And uh, this presents with persistent hearing loss, severe vertigo, tinnitus, tinnitus and persistent ataxia. And, and the, the classic story here is the diver, uh, for whatever reason, isn't paying attention and gets behind on, on clearing their ears and, and uh, equalizing that pressure. And then they get to a depth where they can't do it with their normal mechanism. And, and uh, essentially what happens is, uh, the, the round window is pulled towards the center of that cavity as the volume decreases. And then the diver, uh, because they can't clear in the normal act mechanism, they do a, a vigorous valsalva or not other mechanism that suddenly blows open that eustachian tube, equalizes the pressure, but allows the round window to, to sort of bow back into the cochlea and implode. Um, this is an emergency ENT, an ENT consultation and discussion from the emergency department. And as we'll discuss later, it presents very similar to inner ear DCS. And it's really the history that will, will lead you down one way or the other. Um, but as we'll discuss, if, if there's any concern, uh, training it as inner ear DCS is the, is the way to go. 
Sinus barotrauma is also very common, uh, but we've all at some point in time experienced uh, uh, a sinus infection and we know how bad that te pain and tenderness can be. So divers generally, if they're getting it on descent, don't, uh, don't push through that because the, the pain and discomfort is so significant. They'll call off the dive and they'll try again later or they'll try a couple of days once whatever is going on is resolved. The classic story uh, that I've seen in these instances is a diver that knows they have upper respiratory tract symptoms, maybe a little sinus congestion, and they take a decongestant. Uh, and that allows them to get to depth and, and allows the pressure to equalize. But then that decongestant wears out. And then as they ascend, the ostia are occluded and the air is expanding and causing significant mucosal edema, stripping from the bone and hemorrhage. Uh, but because they're underwater, they have to ascend anyway, and, and they, they can come to the surface with significant epistaxis and pain and discomfort. Treatment is generally conservative, uh, including decongestants and, and possibly antibiotics if it's particularly bad. Kit-related barrel trauma uh, happens fairly frequently. Um, and essentially any airspace the, between the body and the, the, the diver's equipment can, uh, uh, can be subject to the same principles we discussed and can cause uh, bruising, hemorrhage of those tissues. It's fairly common in inexperienced divers or divers who are unfamiliar with new kit and just learning. It's treated conservatively. Dental, dental barrel trauma tends to happen in divers uh, with uh, dental decay or, or recent filling with a small air pocket in it. it tends to happen more frequently on, on ascent as the air expands within that tooth and, and creates a reverse squeeze that fractures the tooth. Referral to dentistry would be, uh, would be the treatment here. And then finally, uh, GI tract barotrauma is, is fairly rare because as we, as we know, the GI tract is, is a long open tube and there's all kinds of uh, place for, for gas to go. But uh, it, it can occur, particularly in instances where there's pre-existing pathology. So they've had surgery and they have adhesions or they have uh, some mild inflammatory bowel disease and, uh, and that causes some degree of structure and, and then they rapidly ascend, the gas expands and, and uh, the, the GI tract can uh, rupture at, that, at those sort of pinch points if the gas expands quickly enough. Um, diagnosis would be a, a diver presenting uh, with significant uh, pain on ascent and uh, no other neuro symptoms and, and you potentially could fi find free air on, uh, in the abdomen and referable surgery would be indicated. So now we've gone uh, and we've, we've descended to depth and now we're at depth. And each one of these topics uh, could be uh, their own hour-long presentation, so I'm only going to briefly uh, comment on them. So, uh, at disorders that occur at depth include nitrogen narcosis, which is also known as rapture of the deep, and it's caused by uh, the intoxicating effects of nitrogen uh, within the tissue and within the brain. Um, it's not exactly clear how it happens, but a good rule of thumb and a good way to think about it is that for every 10 meters of depth, on compressed air is equal to consuming a strong martini. The effects are variable between divers, but it can be very dangerous and result in drowning and, and poor, as a result of poor decision-making and loss of fine motor skills. Um, to combat this, uh, technical divers dive with various uh, mixtures of gases with decreased nitrogen so that they uh, can try to avoid this and go to deeper depths. Oxygen toxicity uh, also is, is quite rare in, in the case of uh, uh, compressed air diving because it requires uh, a partial pressure of oxygen upwards of 1.6 to, to 1.8 before you, you get significant sim symptoms in the acute phase. Uh, the, uh, the most concerning symptom is seizure and, and in technical divers diving with uh, high uh, FiO2 of oxygen, um, it can result in, in drowning if, if they begin having seizures at depth. Uh, contaminated gas is, is always a concern, uh, particularly if divers are, are uh, filling their gas tanks off of uh, uh, a filling station that's poorly maintained. And finally, uh, divers at depth are, are, uh, are subject to uh, environmental conditions like hypothermia. So we've left the bottom and now we're ascending. This is a picture of a submariner uh, practicing escape from an escape tower. Um, 
the escape tower is, is the camp can be described by nothing else uh, of a human sized torpedo tube in which they stand in it. It's rapidly flooded and they're rapidly uh, sent to the surface. Um, as you can imagine, if this, if, if the divers are uh, panicked and they're holding their breath uh, and they don't, uh, that air within their lungs will expand. Uh, and if it doesn't, ha if it can't pass the closed glottis, it'll expand into the tissues. And that's the pathophysiology behind pulmonary barotrauma, which is the second leading cause of death among scuba divers. Um, it's also known as pulmonary overpressure syndrome, and, and, and that's what they'll refer to it as Rosen's and some of the other tech textbooks. Um, uh, so that air expanding uh, within the lungs, if it has nowhere to go, can, can uh, go to one of several places. It can leave through the, the alveolar wall and enter the bronchovascular sheath and, and into the mediastinum and into the subcutaneous tissues. It can uh, leave through the alveolar wall and, and enter into the lung and cause pneumothorax. Uh, or it, as we'll discuss in the most concerning uh, instance, it can leave from the alveolar interface and enter in the, the pulmonary capillaries into the left side of the heart and be disseminated out, uh, systemically and cause the arterial gas embolism. It's very important to note that this can happen on shallow, in shallow water and on short dives. So prefer, pressure differential of only 20 to 80 uh, millimeters of mercury between the alveoli and the chest wall is required to force air in the pulmonary capillary vents. So this corresponds to roughly a change in depth of three to four feet. So uh, a diver presenting with neuro symptoms after a short dive, uh, you do need to con still consider arterial gas embolism because de decompression sickness isn't the only, uh, isn't your only concern. So that air can, uh, as we said, can uh, escape and, and enter in the mediastinum and subcutaneous uh, uh, tissues. These patients are generally hemodynamically stable. They present with chest fullness, pleuritic type chest pain, dyspnea and cough. And uh, diagnosis is typically on chest x-ray where you see this radiolucent band along the cardiac border or retrosternally on the lateral film. Treatment's 100% uh, non-rebreather, which can hasten the extra alveolar gas resorption in supportive care and monitoring otherwise. As a point of trivia, Hammond sign is essentially a, a cracking, crackling or rasping sound that's synchronous with systole, heard over the precordium, particularly in the left lateral decubitus position. So uh, with any of these pulmonary, uh, isolated pulmonary barotrauma syndromes, pneumomediastinum or pneumothorax, you need to look for evidence of arterial gas embolism because the treatment is different, though these generally occur in isolation. So pneumothorax is fairly uncommon and occurs in less than 10% of pulmonary overpressure syndromes, but it's more common if there's predisposing fa uh, factors like previous spontaneous pneumo, any bule or cystic lung disease or something like that. Um, the big risk here is tension pneumothorax. So uh, uh, as the, if there's a big air leak and a lot of air gets in that space, as, as they ascend, uh, that air will continue to expand and, uh, and can cause tension pneumo. So as we know, it's a clinical diagnosis with engorged neck veins, uh, de deviated trachea, decreased breath sounds, and, and hemodynamic instability, and treatment is emergent chest decompression. Otherwise, simple pneumothoraces are diagnosed with chest x-ray and pocus, and they're treated as uh, if they're spontaneous, secondary spontaneous pneumothoraces with a low threshold for thoracostomy. Again, you need to look for evidence of uh, arterial gas in both. So those are, are those sort of pulmonary overpressure syndromes are the disorders of ascent. Uh, and now uh, we're getting into sort of the dive, the, the more blatant dive emergencies that I think a lot of us are accustomed to thinking about. So disorders on surfacing. So arterial gas embolism, as I said, is the most serious complication of that pulmonary barrel trauma. So uh, the classic uh, story here is a diver uh, has a, a rapid panic descent for whatever reason, either they've uh, run out of air or they've had an emergency at depth and they ascend rapidly. Uh, and then they get to the surface, they signal their dive tender or their dive buddy that they're okay, and then they go unconscious. Uh, or conversely, they manage to make it to the boat, they get in the boat and suddenly they're paralyzed. Um, so uh, it's caused as the, the gas uh, bubbles enter the pulmonary veins, um, uh, 
in after they reach arterial circulation that these the, these large volume bubbles uh, typically break up as they, they reach vascular branch points and they lodge in smaller vessels and can cause distal ischemia and they can activate uh, local inflammas, inflammatory cytokines. Every system can be affected. The bubbles can go to the CNS, they can go to the spinal cord, there can be renal embolization, subsequent hematuria and acute kidney injury, and the GI and uterine uh, so, uh, vasculature can also be affected. These bubbles can also coalesce and, and cause even larger obstruction as they go. So again, uh, just to highlight that this can happen in shallow water and on short dives. So this is a, this is a medical emergency. Treatment uh, is uh, as we treat any patient in, in extremis. So ABCs, airway interven intervention, and if indicated, and in most recompression chambers, they can accommodate a, a ventilator. Uh, and then the the uh, these patients should be placed on 100% O2. Fluids can uh, decrease vascular obstruction and augment collateral flow and improve, improve blood flow. And then uh, the most important thing is these patients need recompression. Prognosis uh, is improved with early treatment and cerebral air emboli with a sh and there's a sharp decrease in clinical efficacy after only four to five hour delay. So don't delay transfer for advanced imaging or testing. Uh, and uh, talk to talk to a hyperbaric physician via critical as soon as possible. Um, it's uh, if if possible, it's a good idea to look for and treat pneumothoraces because, uh, as you can imagine, putting somebody in a tank with in in a recompression chamber with uh, a pneumothorax can lead to significant complications, including tension pneumo as they ascend. <clears throat> so that brings us to. You know the classic dive injury that uh, that we all hear about in, in the bends. Uh, so decompression sickness. So uh, you know you can think of it as your your soda stream, uh, so to speak, that you've injected a bunch of uh, carbon dioxide or a bunch of gas into that liquid. You've got the cap on, and uh, the there's no bubbling in the liquid. It, it looks uh, uh, and there's no bubbling in suspension, but then you release the cap and, and bubbles start to fizz off. And if you shake it up and release the cap quickly, you'll get even more bubbles. Um, bubbles are seen frequently post-dive in, in many dives, uh, and, it's, and it's generally volume of bubbles that, that lead to significant uh, consequence. And it's not simply venal occlusive. So bubbles can uh, do form in the vasculature and can uh, occlude and cause distal ischemia, but they can also uh, occur in tendons and, and joints and cause uh, local, uh, local pressure and, and uh, ischemic symptoms as a result of that. And bubbles are also uh, uh, highly inflammogenic. So the, bubble, the body treats the bubble as, as a foreign invader, coats it with protein, activates complement, and, uh, and uh, lasting inflammatory cascades, even if the bubble is shrunk can occur, and, and you can have ongoing symptoms as a result of that. So, there's a number of risk factors for the development of decompression sickness, including the classic things that we think about, like age and smoking status, as well as dehydration and cold water diving, as well, and, and also strenuous physical activity on the diet. But the greatest risk factor is really depth and time. So the US Navy and, and the Canadian forces and multiple other agencies across the world have developed dive tables that uh, allow a diver to estimate how long they can go to the bottom and, and uh, before they have to worry about significant risk of decompression sickness and before they have to uh, start to think about doing decompression stops. Um, this U.S. Navy dive table, I'm going to ask you to, to ignore sort of the A to O section of this. Those are, are what's called repet factors and if a diver is doing multiple dives in a day it allows them to assign themselves one of those letters and then use another table to look at how long and how deep they can go on the next dive. What I want us to focus on right now is the the, the the left three columns. So for instance, if I go down to a depth of 10.7 meters, my need, no decompression limit is 310 minutes. So I can stay at, at depths without a, a significant risk of decompression sickness for a very long time. The average scuba tank at that depth will last about 30 to 45 minutes. So you're gonna be well within your uh, no decompression limit. However, if I go deeper, let's say I go to 33.5 meters, suddenly my no deco limit it is 20 minutes, which isn't a lot of time. And if I'm in a tank at that depth, the last 10 to 15 minutes. So if I'm diving with dual 
uh, scuba tanks, I could reach that uh, decompression, uh, no decompression limit fairly quickly and uh, may uh, incur a, a decompression stop. And, and uh, if I ignore that, or uh, even if I'm slightly within the window, I am still at risk of developing decompression sickness. So de decompression sickness is classically thought about as the mild uh, type ones and the, the more serious type twos. Um, the, the bulk of decompression sickness is the, I'll tell you, is the type ones. This graph on the right uh, seems to say different, uh, but these are all the cases reported to uh, the D Divers Alert Network in 2016. And uh, in, uh, generally the cases that are getting reported are generally the severe cases. So uh, I like to think about it, but uh, really just boil it down to mild or severe. So mild include the, the joint and, and musculoskeletal, the skin and the lymphatics. Joint uh, BCS generally presents with significant pain around the joint, usually uh, increasing uh, with no associated erythema or swelling. Uh, it tends to, in divers to affect both, uh, the shoulder and the elbow uh, greater than the, the knee and the hip. Skin DCS, uh, or skin bends, uh, forms as bubbles uh, form in the capillaries and the subcutaneous tissue and can cause this molting and marbling uh, in significant rash and pur puritis. It's, fairly, it's generally self-limited. And then you can also get lymphatics occluding uh, lymph channels and resulting in pain and edema. These respond really well to treatment and, and typically uh, there's a full resolution, particularly if these uh, divers are recompressed. And then we have the more serious uh, uh, decompression sicknesses. So the, the central nervous system, the cardiopulmonary and the inner ear DCS, um, which can be fatal in time of treatment is, is more, uh, is certainly more concerning. This uh, recompression chamber here on the right is, is the duocom chamber that we take in the, the forces with us to uh, remote areas. That picture was taken in the high Arctic. And uh, essentially, there, it's a two-person chamber. The dive tender, the guy taking care of the stricken diver, sits in the, the L shape of that boot. And then the diver's loaded in uh, through the bottom and the cap is, is, is screwed on and, and you're dove uh, in the treatment table. Um, I've never treated somebody in there, but uh, we've, we've dove there in, in it multiple times just, uh, just for practice. So uh, central nervous system DCS uh, in diving, the majority uh, tends to be characterized by spinal cord involvement. So uh, from a pathophysiologic perspective, it's thought that the bubbles form and coalesce within the low pressure venous plexi in the cord, particularly in the lumbar spine and causes obstruction and stasis. The bubbles can also form directly within that nervous tissue. Uh, and that likely plays an additional role. These cases generally present, generally present with paresthesias, weakness predominates, and there's a loss of sphincter and urinary retention. But, uh, but bubbles can also uh, form in, in, in the brain and cause uh, significant neuro symptoms, including headache, visual disturbances, sensory and motor loss, paresthesias, uh, fatigue, and, and it doesn't present like a, a normal thromboembolic stroke in, that, in a territorial distribution. These can be migratory symptoms as the bubbles form and, and, and resolve and, and collateral uh, flow is made around them. And, uh, and it can be a, a very sort of a diffuse neuro presentation. Cardiopulmonary chokes, you can think of this as, as if shaking a a pop can and opening up suddenly. And, and that sudden release of pressure causes significant bubbling. The, the classic story here is, is a diver that's dove deep has had some sort of emergency. Uh, and despite the occurrence of that, uh, that significant gas load, they have to ascend emergently uh, for whatever reason. So they ascend to the surface and uh, all of that bubbles, all of those bubbles dissolve in the tissue. Uh, and, and return to the lungs and the lungs become overwhelmed. These divers present a significant uh, respiratory distress, pain, wheezing, dyspnea, and uh, it can be fatal with acute right heart failure, airlock, and circulatory collapse and death. And death sorry. Inner ear DCS uh, presents very similar to the, 
uh, inner ear uh, barrel trauma that we discussed earlier with significant tinnitus, hearing loss, uh, vertigo, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, and it can occur in isolation it, uh, without any other signs of decompression sickness. But it's fairly rare in, in low decompression air diving and tends to be more uh, associated with deep helium gas diving or, or uh, particularly if there's multiple gas uh, switches. It, it's formed as bubbles, or it results as bubbles form within the, the indolent, and uh, and they they may not respond well to to recompression. This can cause significant morbidity. Um, so it, it can be difficult to differentiate between the the inner ear DCS and the inner ear barrel trauma. Uh, in, in history, is the biggest the biggest clue here. This tends to happen on the surface after the dive, whereas inner ear uh, barrel trauma tends to happen on descent with a vigorous valsalva. But when in doubt, treat for inner ear DCS because uh, the consequences of not can be significant for the dive. So differentiating between arterial gas embolism and, and, and AGE. Uh, and, it, and the big uh, differentiation is symptom onset. So 99% of AGE occur within 10 minutes, while uh, well, DCS can take a, a lot longer to happen. And uh, that delay in time probably relates more to the, the, those inflammatory cascades that are, that are activated, whereas AGE are big bubbles and, and cause acute ischemia. Uh, the DCS are, is smaller bubbles and, and uh, there's sort of a time lag between uh, occlusion and inflammatory mediators and, and, uh, uh, and symptom, symptoms. Outside of 24 hours, um, decompression sickness, uh, is gen the diagnosis is generally questionable. And uh, earlier the onset, the worse, uh, the worse the prognosis in these cases. For us though, as emergency room physicians, the differentiation is largely academic, and it's useful to group these two phenomena in an overarching term called decompression illness, because the, the ultimate treatment is the same. They need uh, urgent clinical hyperbaric consultation and, and recompression. So uh, approach to all of these divers, ABCs, treat and address other life-threatening conditions. Use a chest tube or a pigtail uh, if you see a pneumothorax and ship as soon as possible. If the diagnosis isn't in question, don't delay for said CT head or, or, or uh, any other advanced diagnost diagnostics. These patients need recompression. So all that being said, if you take nothing else from this, this uh, presentation, this infographic uh, from Rosen's sort of lays it all out. And in a very simplified approach, are, are asking yourself three different questions. So, what were the particulars of the dive? So, uh, it's, it's good to get a complete dive profile, including depth, bottom time, equipment, and gas use, uh, because that can give you an idea of the nitrogen burden and the risk of decompression sickness, or uh, any peculiarities peculiarities related to the dive. So. Uh, level of exertion, uh, any pre-dive medications that could lead you uh, down the road of, of the barrow traumas, or any panicked or rapid ascent for any reason that can lead you down the road of arterial gas flows. And then, uh, you know, the probably most important questions when those things first. Uh, then you're looking at the non-pulmonary barrel traumas. Did they occur at death? Then you're looking at the gas and the environmental problems that we discussed. And, or did it occur on ascent or at the surface? Um, in that case, the dive profile becomes more important. So was it a pulmonary overpressure? Or, say again? Hello? You know, we lost you there. Uh, um, the audio went out. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, um, uh, you know, the, the, the most important question really is when did those symptoms first appear? So did it appear on descent? Uh, in which cases you're, you're thinking about the barrel trauma, the non-pulmonary barrel traumas. Did it happen at, at depth? In which case you're thinking about uh, the gas problems, nitrogen mycosis, oxygen toxicity. Uh, and then did it happen on ascent? So you're thinking about 
uh, what's the dive profile? Were they a long deep dive and near their decompression limits? So you're thinking about decompression sickness or, or was it a rapid uh, uh, panic descent, in which case you're thinking about the pulmonary depression. And then finally, does this patient have neuro deficits? Because if they do, AGE or decompression sickness should be at the, the top of your differential and urgent decompression should be considered. So we'll, we'll return to the case. So, so this is a 26-year-old male presenting with lower abdominal pain and leg weakness following a dive at Tobermory. So the first question you ask is, what were the particulars of the dive? And he tells you that he uh, was doing compressed gas diving on consecutive days. Uh, that was the only dive of the day. It was a depth to 37 meters and his bottom time was about 14 minutes. And I'll tell you that is the upper limit of, uh, of uh, his decompression uh, schedule. So then your next question is, when did those symptoms first appear? And he tells you that they appeared two hours after the end of dive. So this, uh, so right here, you know it's, not a, it's likely not a disorder of descent. It's likely not a disorder of, on the bottom. And, and you're probably looking more uh, along the lines of decompression sickness. And then does this patient have neural deficits? And uh, you, you put the ultrasound on his abdomen, shows the distended bladder. He's unable to avoid. Uh, and there's obvious weakness and, and blunted deep tendon reflex on the right side. So uh, your diagnosis here, and anybody can throw it out. The diagnosis is uh, decompression illness. So serious uh, de decompression sickness. And the treatment would be emergent recompression. So. There are uh, multiple recompression chambers in, in Ontario, uh, including Ottawa, Toronto, Tobermory, and Hamilton. Um, those facility, facilities rotate on call duty, duties, and it's my understanding that Hamilton covers a, a large proportion throughout the year. Um, they're accessed via, via critical, and it's the, and uh, I, uh, I had to call them a couple weeks ago. Uh, for this very uh, instance, and, and, it, and uh, it went as well as any critical uh, call goes, and they were quite prompt at, at getting me in touch with the uh, with the clinical hyperbaric physician. And then, if you're elsewhere or you're remote, Divers Alert Network that you can uh, look up online has a 20, uh, 24 7 365 emergency uh, line that can help you find the, the uh, closest recompression channel. And then uh, if you're thinking about transferring these patients and you're thinking about flying them, uh, they should be flown at the lowest, safest altitude. So they'll, uh, they'll get to the recompression chamber and, and generally they receive a, a treatment table set. So we won't get into the implications of that uh, or the, the nitty gritty of that, but essentially they're dove to uh, almost, three ap uh, almost three atmospheres and they stay down there for uh, three cycles of 20 minutes oxygen breathing followed by a five minute air break to try to prevent development of oxygen toxicity and then they'll, they'll ascend to, to roughly 1.2 atmospheres and we'll stay there for an extended period of time and then they'll bring them back to the surface. Uh, for severe DCS, they're treated uh, uh, or arterial gas embolism with residual symptoms. They're treated over consecutive days until uh, their symptoms either completely resolve or uh, they plateau after several days. So. Let's say uh, that patient that we saw, his uh, friends with him and, and he's planning a, a trip and he asks, when can I fly? So the general safe recommendation is 24 hours um, in that, that the Dan will say that and the, the US Navy will also say that, but uh, they do establish minimums. So for a, a minimum single no decompression dive in a day, uh, the minimum flight time is 12 hours. The minimum surface time is 12 hours. For multi-day diving or multiple dives in a single day, the minimum is 18 hours. Um, uh, generally, it's a safe bet just saying 24. So this is a case I saw a couple of weeks ago uh, at UH. So this was a 64-year-old experienced diver presenting with significant confusion. So we go back to our, our three-question approach. What were the particulars of the dive? He was compressed air diving uh, to the bottom of the pool to place a drain, and it was about six to eight feet. Um, and he didn't have enough weight to stay on the bottom. So he was really struggling at putting this drain on, and, and he was sort of floating back up because uh, he didn't have any weight on. 
When did the symptoms first appear? So immediately upon ascent, he experienced marked confusion. He didn't remember that dive, uh, didn't really remember where he was. He was a broken record. He was generally verbose saying a lot of stuff, but not really saying anything. And, and he was a bit euphoric and, and seemed quite happy. I got on the phone with his wife and she was talking to him and she said it was certainly a change from his baseline. So, uh, the next question was, does this patient have neuro deficits? So uh, from a, a neuro, uh, physical neuro exam, there, there were no deficits, but he certainly had no short-term recall. Couldn't, uh, I had to tell him multiple times what my concerns were, why I was there. He couldn't remember three objects and he was clearly confused. His chest x-ray was negative and the CT had this back. So uh, the differential diagnosis, uh, was uh, decompression sickness versus uh, global transient amnesia. Uh, in, in the absence of that dive history, this very well looked like a global transient amnesia, and it could have been. The problem is, is it happened as soon as he, in, as soon as he uh, ascended, and uh, he had that sort of semi-classic history of, of being in, engaged in, in an activity uh, at the bottom with poor buoyancy control where, uh, you know, if you're, you're doing something, you can hold your breath and then you float up and it only takes, you know, as I said, four to six feet of, of pressure differential to, to push some air into the, into the capillary bed. So uh, I, I called Critical. I got on the phone with the hyperbaric physician. He agreed that uh, the, the story was concerning enough, and we uh, brought him to Hamilton. I accompanied him because it was the end of my shift, and, uh, and I was doing this presentation. I thought it'd be a great opportunity. Um, and then uh, he received a treatment table of six. Short-term recall improved, was significantly improved afterwards. Uh, the re repetitive conversation was, res was resolved, but I will note that uh, I don't put a lot of credence in, in my sort of post-dive uh, exam because it was four in the morning. He'd had some Ativan in the chamber and, and you know, it was difficult to assess. But he, we got back to UH, he was admitted to, to medicine and he was discharged the following day completely back to baseline. I'd say the differential is still unchanged. What, did it get better because this global transient amnesia improved or did it get better because it was uh, an arterial gas embolism that improved? Uh, it could be one or the other, but uh, either way, I think it, it was reasonable to dive that guy because of that proximity to the dive. So take homes. Uh, diving is a popular pastime across the world and Ontario is no exception. And uh, though rare, you're likely to see some of these injuries throughout your career. Onset of symptoms is very important in developing your differential and, and determining your subsequent treatment. Arterial gas embolisms, so big air bubbles and decompression sickness, small nitrogen bubbles can result in significant tissue ischemia and require recompression. And finally, any neuro symptoms following hyperbaric exposure is highly suggestive of a decompression injury. And, and if you have any doubts, call a hyperbaric clinician, talk about it, and, and they can help you through it. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, any questions? This is me uh, in the high Arctic doing a, a polar dip. The temperature was uh, minus 60 degrees outside that tent, and the tent was heated roughly to minus 20 to minus 25. Questions or, or comments? Has anybody seen any dive injuries to their career? Uh, hey, Chris, it's Mason. Um, no, I haven't seen dive injuries, and I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, you saw one in preparing this presentation. How often would you say we should expect to see things like this? Do you think it's kind of a question of, of looking for it more, or are they that common? I just haven't managed to see one yet. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I think they're, they're they, they are fairly rare. The, the barotraumas, uh, in, uh, particularly the non-pulmonary barotraumas are quite frequent. And, and I've seen uh, one or two in the context of swimming uh, since being at, uh, at uh, in uh, London. But the, the decompression sicknesses and, and the AGEs are, uh, are very rare. And, and divers generally, um, recognize those symptoms and, and will either get a hold of Dan on their own or uh, or be able to tell you, you know, I was diving and I think I have decompression sickness or I was diving and I think I have AGE. So, uh, you know, it, it'll be rare, but but I think uh, I think you, whenever you see a diver, you need to, to keep these three questions in mind. And when did the symptoms onset is really the biggest, uh, biggest question you need to think of.
Gibby, have you been involved with, uh, like when you practice up in Tobermory, were you involved with the dive medicine up there? Um, oh, you're sorry, you're talking to somebody else? Uh, John Gibson. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and I'd say we, we usually had about one or two cases a year up there that uh, somebody would be concerned about and that we'd uh, run in the uh, recompression chain. But that was an excellent talk, Chris. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. I can give you the, the over 30 years in London, we maybe seen, I've heard about maybe three or four cases. The other, the other thing, uh, the other interesting tidbit I learned when I was in, in Hamilton with the, at the chamber is uh, earlier that week, they'd had another patient from uh, London uh, that they dove as a result of a, an iatrogenic gas embolism. So uh, they, they were giving a, a patient um, IV antibiotics for cellulitis and, and he had stroke-like symptoms and, and uh, they suspected that uh, they, they injected air into the system and he probably had, we didn't talk about it, but if you have a PFO uh, the, the, in, a, in a right to left shunt, air bubbles can enter through that and cause arterial gas embolism uh, really anywhere in your body. And they treat, they dove him and, and his symptoms uh, improved significantly. It was interesting, just reading up on this for this talk, like, uh, yeah, I must admit, I always think of uh, diving injuries as, you know, you have to have a scuba tank on your back, uh, you know, to kind of get this differential going, but, um, you know, albeit, it's, you know, it's rarer, uh, you know, there's definitely um, disbears and injuries from bare trauma to the arterial gas embolus. Uh, without a scuba tank on your back. So it's not just nitrogen, you know, compressed air that's, you know, that's hurting us and, you know, free divers or, you know, there's stuff in, uh, just like online, there were like uh, some, you know, some teenagers doing, I don't know how they got down to 30 meters, that's impressive, but 30 meter, you know, just like holding their breath, going down, presented with arterial gas embolism. So, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just a scuba tank. Uh, so, you know, think about that. And, and uh, you know, we, we, you and I discussed a case that I left it out for the purpose of time, but uh, I had a case in the military where I saw a guy walking down the hall and, and he was clearly a toxic. And uh, I, uh, I was sort of over, li over listening to him talk to the clerk and he said, I think I have decompression sickness. So I, I immediately grabbed him because my interest was peaked and, and he was a toxic walking to my office. And I asked, uh, you know, what was your, what were you doing? And he was breath hold diving uh, over a period of two hours. And he did uh, multiple dives over that period going down to about 10 meters. And on the very last dive, he came up and he, and he uh, experienced this sudden disequilibrium, vertigo, thought it was seasickness. He swam to the shore, uh, had persistent ataxia and vertigo, um, and naturally went to the bar and, and had a few drinks and woke up the next morning still uh, vertiginous and ataxic, and then he presented to the clinic. So, uh, you know, it, it's exceptionally rare to have an arterial gas embolism as a result of, of breath hold diving because there's no net gain in, of, uh, of oxygen so uh, or air into that system. But uh, we dove him, his symptoms got significantly better. He had multiple treatments and was completely resolved. And uh, all of the, the, the consultants in dive medicine throughout the cast sort of sat down to think about it and they think either he had decompression sickness and those multiple dives just continued to increase his nitrogen load or uh, potentially each time you dive you get a you get a dive reflex and blood is shunted to your core and uh, perhaps he he uh, sort of engorged his pulmonary vasculature so much by those repetitive dives that it, it allowed enough shearing force on, on the rapid changes in pressure to, uh, to pop uh, some alveoli and cause an arterial gas embolism. Uh, it, was, it was a really interesting case. Any other questions? Perfect. I'd like to thank everybody for their attention, and I hope this gave you a bit of an approach and, uh, uh, and uh, will help you if you see any of these injuries moving forward. Good job, Chris.
Great job, Chris. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Thanks. Oh, I was going to say, that's awesome.